the point of this session, right, is, is we're trying to talk about what's next, what's coming. In prostate cancer, as everyone knows, I mean, we went through, you know, decades where there was limited progress, right? You know, I like to point out from, from 2000, from what, 1941 to, you know, 2010, we had something like seven new drug approvals, right? Now, 2010 to 2023, what do we have? 15, 16 new FDA labels, right? The pace of change is entirely different from what it once was. And the good news is, we're not close to slowing down. We're continuing to accelerate. The pipeline for, for prostate cancer right now is fantastic. I mean, Oliver's talked to you about some of it. William's talked to you about some of it. Um, and what's important with that is not just that there's so many compounds being developed, uh, not just that, that right now we're committed to doing studies in this space, which I think for years the commitment was lukewarm, but it's also that the, the potential mechanisms by which we're trying to attack prostate cancer at this point are very diverse. Right? It's not just going after the AR. It's not just chemotherapy. It's not just radio ligands. It's a lot of different things. Um, so, you know, I, I think one of the, the points I'd tried, I, I would try to emphasize to everybody is, is remember, our goal here is to cure metastatic disease. And as of today, there is no cure for metastatic prostate cancer. Right? 80, 90% of the men with metastatic disease will die of their prostate cancer. Um, the other 10 to 20 percent, you know, die of something else before the prostate gets them. Now, that doesn't discount the fact that we all have a few examples of patients that, you know, live a long time with one therapy or another. But really, on a population level, we are not curing metastatic prostate cancer today. And to get there, I believe we're going to have it, it's going to come down to discovering something new. It's not going to be anything we have in our hands right now. So what I'm going to try to talk about here is at least some of the things that are currently being developed. This is, you know, a very short list, just some examples. Um, and, and some of this we've heard about the bispecifics. I'll just show some details of a couple of the others. My point here isn't to say that these are necessarily the very best drugs or the ones that are going to change the landscape, but they are ones that have some, you know, exciting preliminary data. And, and my plea, of course, always is in this era, right, with our commitment to saying, let's cure this disease, please do refer your patients for clinical trials or put them on trials, you know, whatever your practice uh, uh, type is. So um, the AR is not dead as a target. There are still potentially other ways we can target the AR. And I absolutely agree with Oliver that, you know, if we can get to the era where we don't have to target AR, that would be a win without question. But nevertheless, you know, the AR remains the single most powerful oncogenic driver in the human genome, right? I mean, there's about 5,000 genes that are under direct transcriptional control of the androgen receptor. That's out of 20,500 or so genes in the human genome, right? So there actually is no other uh, uh, gene promoter that controls more genes than the AR. And that's why by itself it can cause oncogenesis. That's why by itself it becomes a powerful target for inhibition. So this is a few examples of next generation drugs trying to target the AR. So when we think about uh, you know, the, the, the various ways to uh, inhibit the androgen receptor, one potential mechanism is what are known as protax. So these are molecules that are designed to promote the degradation of the androgen receptor. So they specifically, uh, they enter the cell, they bind to the AR, they promote ubiquitination and they put the androgen receptor on the typical protein degradation pathway. So it's increasing the turnover of the androgen receptor, right? All proteins are of course turned over uh, with the balance between synthesis and degradation in the human cell. We push the balance towards rapid degradation with these protax. Protax are a concept that are being tested in many different cancers uh, relevant to us here for the AR. So AR, the ARDENT trial looks at one of these compounds, ARV110, uh, in men with MCRPC, you know, as a phase one, two, right? It's first a safety study and then just a response rate study, looking at the resist response rate and the PSA response rate. Uh, baseline characteristics here, you can see the men had previously received ABI or ENZA, three quarters of them had previously received chemotherapy. Uh, 30 to 40% had visceral disease. 
And so there's some promising results, right? In this waterfall plot, you see PSA decline, 46% uh, of patients having a PSA 50 response, 57% uh, having a PSA 30 response. For the small number of men with measurable disease, you know, most of them are having some degree of response, but of course we define 30% as the cutoff for, for calling it a partial response. And at the very right, you see what we call the swimmer's plot, right? With each line representing patients on therapy, the lines with arrows representing uh, men who are still on therapy. You know, this line goes out to 48 weeks. So, you know, th that's a decent amount of patients still on therapy six months out, despite the fact that most of them have seen at least one androgen receptor pathway inhibitor and chemotherapy. So, you know, there is evidence of activity. Is it enough? You know, is it going to be enough to be uh, a meaningful tool in the armamentarium that remains to be seen, but at least there's activity uh, with this strategy. Um, some subgroup analysis here by, uh, by the pretreatment. Um, and I think in the interest of time, we won't linger on it too much. Uh, but then in terms of safety, you know, this falls within general, uh, you know, ranges that we expect, you know, less than 10% of patients needing discontinuation, less than 10% of uh, patients needing dose reduction, some fatigue, some nausea, whatnot, largely grade one, two, right? Very low. Another potential compound, ODM-208. So, you know, we haven't gotten away from the importance of, of the androgen synthesis pathway, right? I mean, as, as prostate cancer physicians, we're oncologic endocrinologists in so many ways. And of course, we, you know, we were used to uh, kind of broad-based inhibition back in the days of ketoconazole hitting, you know, this, this uh, pathway at multiple steps. We got more used to a cleaner inhibition with abiraterone. But there's also the, uh, the possibility of uh, altering disease with complete steroid biosynthesis inhibition at the level of CYP11A1. And that's what ODM208 tries to do. So this is the phase one, two study of ODM208. Again, you know, very similar design, right? MCRPC pretreated patients. That's what we do with phase one studies. Uh, the principal endpoint, of course, of phase one is toxicity. Part two is gonna be response. And again, here we see the waterfall plots of the PSA response on bottom. There was also uh, an analysis looking at patients who have mutations in the ligand binding domain of the AR receptor. So this is one of the mechanisms for resistance to antiandrogens, right? The, a mutation in the ligand binding domain, which then prevents the binding of the antiandrogen. With that, there's nevertheless ligand stimulation with the native ligand that is androgen. Uh, with some of these. And is it very encouraging that with this strategy that AR mutated patients are still responding, right? So, and, and then up here you see, you know, the evidence of the androgen suppression. So here again, a potentially active compound, um, adrenal insufficiency, no surprise, right? You cut off the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway, the steroid biosynthesis pathway early, you get adrenal insufficiency. Uh, here's further, right? Uh, uh, response. Here's our uh, PSA response, the resist response, and then again, the swimmer's plot. So again, you know, promising data at a phase two level. Questions about the best design for a phase three study uh, and, and uh, viability moving forward. But nevertheless, right, it continues to show that even after our current generation of androgen receptor pathway inhibitors, ABI, ENZA, APA, darolutamide, that there is still uh, viability and targeting the AR pathway. Um, again, toxicity data here. And then yet another strategy uh, for going after the AR pathway involves TAS3681, uh, another novel compound. And, and Dr. DeBono talked about this at, uh, at ASCO in 2021. Remember, the androgen receptor is a cytosolic protein, right? So the ligand androgen enters a cell, binds with the AR in the cytosol, where it's stabilized by heat shock protein and other proteins. And after ligand binding, that then translocates to the nucleus, uh, where it binds to the androgen um, receptor binding domains and, and induces uh, genetic tra uh, transcription. There are opportunities to block translocation to the nucleus, 
course, we always think that this is one of the things that docetaxel actually does, right? Is, is it inhibits the uh, cellular machinery for, for protein uh, translocation or uh, movement within the cell. Um, but there's also the opportunity to, to block the binding of the AR to the antigen response elements. So TAS3681, again, uh, this phase one study looking primarily at toxicity. Of course, we get some uh, efficacy signal in the phase two portion. Uh, this is the early data uh, looking at the dose escalation, right? And what kind of plasma concentrations we get uh, during that dose escalation. But here's the PSA 50 response rate. Again, there is efficacy to even after Abby, Enza, et cetera, of uh, continuing to target the androgen receptor pathway. Dose dependent, right? Not a surprise. I mean, th the reason these don't look so good in phase one is of course we start with very, very low doses. And then once you get the higher doses, the response rates escalate, right? And those are the doses we'll move forward with in phase two studies. Some you know, information about toxicities, nothing really stands out. I mean, this is, this is fairly typical. All right, bispecific antibodies. And, and, and Dr. Sarter talked to you, you know, some about this. Um, I'm going to expand on a couple of others. We already heard about AMG160, but there's other uh, molecules as well, AMG757 and 509. Um, and with these bispecific antibodies, right, I mean, you're not limited as, with an antibody to two arms, but bispecifics are, are two arm antibodies, this is IgG, of course, and are now tri-specific antibodies as well, and we can go beyond. And you can manipulate either arm here, right? So you can have a different target for the tumor cell, but you can also have different targets for the uh, immune cell. And of course, the goal here, this is like a, a, an arranged marriage, right? We're trying to, we're trying to bring two, um, unwilling participants into an arranged marriage. And hopefully when you do that, you get sparks. In this case, we want the sparks, not like in real life, right? Um, and uh, so for AMG160, again, Dr. Sarter already talked about that, right? CD3 versus PSMA. AMG757 is using DLL3 as the target uh, on the tumor cell, CD3 on the T cells. DLL3 is a target that's overexpressed on a lot of uh, neuroendocrine, advanced neuroendocrine tumors. So it's a common target, for example, on small cell lung cancer. And we've seen effective drug antibody conjugates uh, targeting DLL3. So now this is trying to use that same target in prostate cancer, but this study is specific, or this molecule is specific then intended for neuroendocrine prostate cancer or advanced small cell prostate cancer. Um, same concept, AMG509 is looking at a target called STEEP1. You know, the, the two things that we're trying to do with bispecific antibodies is get a good specific target for the tumor cell, but also then try to find a, a target that doesn't overstimulate the immune system. And what Dr. Sarter was referring to with these immunotherapies is this, you know, this cytokine storm is like what many of you would have been familiar with back in the days of high dose IL-2 for, for renal cell carcinoma. You remember we, we had these men or men and women in the ICU, you know, they, they were in this uh, sepsis like picture, the neurotoxicity. It's really that same profile as we saw with high dose IL-2. Again, we have to think about is the cost, right? Worth the, uh, the potential benefit. Uh, if it's curative, that's one thing like in the days of RCC when we didn't have anything else. Uh, but if it's, uh, you know, if the cure rate is extremely poor uh, and the death rate is higher, then obviously it won't be worth it. And that's where AMG160 has been pulled back at this point, right? There's the, the likelihood that they have a better molecule that will reduce the toxicity profile and therefore increase the therapeutic index of the strategy. Uh, so I want to spend time on the 160. We've talked about this a little bit. Uh, but 757 is moving forward. We have that open at our center, uh, looking at patients with uh, neuroendocrine or small cell prostate cancer. AMG 509 uh, is moving forward as well. All right, and then antibody drug conjugates. You know, I, I pull this one out more as an example of the uh, class of drugs. You know, an antibody drug conjugate is essentially, it's the same thing we're talking about with Pluvicto, right? You have a targeting molecule uh, in this case, an antibody, you have a drug, 
whether it's, if it's a radioisotope, then we're talking about radioligand therapy, but it can also in many cases be traditional chemotherapy, often chemotherapeutic drugs that are too toxic to be given just straight IV in a general sense. Uh, you can't achieve serum concentrations that are safe for a patient unless you can deliver the chemotherapy directly to the cancer cell and therefore concentrate the chemotherapy at the tumor without getting the same level of systemic uh, drug exposure. I mean, that's really what an antibody drug conjugate is about, right? High intertumoral levels, low systemic exposure, same thing we're trying to do with radioligand therapy. All right, so this is just one example using B7H3 uh, as a target and complex to deruxtecan. This is an old drug, and, and a lot of these are you know, very generic old drugs. Again, would be too toxic if given independently, but can be given at safe levels when uh, conjugated to an antibody. B7, the, the concept between, behind the targets for all these drugs it, is overexpression on tumor cells with less expression on healthy cells and a differential there that's large enough right, to allow you to achieve the therapeutic index necessary. So this has been tried in a phase one, two study. And here again, you see you know, a, a waterfall plot with a response rate. There's clear activity. Right now, the question is, is that activity enough? Is a therapeutic index big enough to justify ongoing drug development? We'll see. But really, you know, that, that index is going to be dependent uh, upon the toxicity, right? So what do we see at the recommended phase two dose? You know, 60% of patients having nausea, 35% anemia, fatigue in a quarter of patients. These aren't great numbers, but this is within the realm of, of what we can certainly manage uh, in the oncology clinic. So in summary, you know, th this is just a quick survey of some compounds that are out there. The good news is this is a very short list and the vast number of compounds beyond this is, is greater than what we've talked about. There's a ton of activity in metastatic prostate cancer now, but the job is clearly not done until we've cured metastatic disease. Um, Ongoing research, accrual to clinical trials is absolutely vital, and uh, I thank you all for your time.